is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation cross question with Ian Dale. Well, let's go to our first caller. It's Stephen in East Grinstead. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Good evening, Ian. Good evening, panel. Are the Nottinghamshire constituents of Ashfield being robbed and hoodwinked out of a by-election by the Reform UK Party and their so-called new MP, Lee Anderson? You could say Robin hoodwinked. Charlotte Nichols fed me that line just before the news, so if you don't find it funny, blame her. Right. But it struck me that Zoe referenced people feeling unsafe um, and it seems striking that we may be losing sight of what it was that prompted these unfortunate remarks, which is the fact that people have been feeling unsafe on the streets of London that we've seen week after week, pro-Hamas, pro-terror marches with the Metropolitan Police seemingly completely unable to police them properly. Uh, and that since the Metropolitan Police has failed in that, we've also I, seen... I've got to pick you up from that because clearly there are people who support Hamas on those marches, but they're actually organised by the Free Palestine movement, which is rather different from how you described it. Well, the fact that you have people on these marches organised including by the PSC, calling uh, for genocide, essentially, which is what From the River to the Sea stands for, that you have clear support for Hamas being voiced because these started, let's not okay. forget, immediately let's, after the 7th of October. Right. So this, but this is critical because it's what prompted it. And the fact that uh, ordinary Londoners, uh, as well as others around the UK, have seen this happening week after week on the streets uh, and the police completely ineffective. And then on top of that, we haven't what seen What do you mean anything. the police are ineffective? Well, they haven't been enforcing the law. Basic provisions of the Public Order Act of the Terrorism Act haven't been enforced. And we've seen over the last five months, examples uh, I would uh, identify as clearly um, in, in breach. Uh, we've seen calls for jihad, we've call, seen calls for intifada. I mean, here in the UK, we've seen what intifada looks okay. like on the 7 7 We're bombings. going completely off the subject. We are. Um, so well, let's get back on it. Well, no, but this is the very point, because this chaos and this debate that has erupted has completely distracted from the instigation of, uh, of, of the remarks that were made uh, and the calling out of the failure of both the Metropolitan Police and the Mayor of London. The Metropolitan Police... But he called Sadiq... He said that... Or alleged that mm -hmm. Sadiq Khan was being controlled by Islamists. I think we all are agreeing that the, the remarks that were made are extremely unfortunate, not least because unfortunate. they have completely, not least because they have completely distracted from the issue, which I think anyone who heard the remarks um, in the context of which it was the failure to do anything about the, the London marches in particular, uh, it would be clear. So the fact that this debate has moved so significantly and now we're looking at a possible well debate about a by-election so close to a general election in a, in a situation of real chaos, I mean, and that's completely shifted the argument. Okay. Right, let's go to another text question from Eleanor in Portsmouth. Netanyahu has vowed to ignore Biden's red line that the US president would not tolerate an Israeli attack on the city of Rafa, which could now begin any day. Can America still restrain Netanyahu from giving awful orders to his forces? Now, um, the, to, uh, yesterday was the deadline that Israel said that if the hostages weren't released, then this attack would begin. It hasn't yet. Uh, Natasha, let's start with you. Well, it's difficult to know where to start with the sort of false premises of that question. Uh, the first is this issue of red lines. I mean, I listened to the uh, interview that Biden gave. It was um, incoherent, to say the least. And I think we have to cut him some slack because when he's not speaking with a teleprompter, uh, he tends to uh, to occasionally say things that he doesn't mean. But this idea that Rafa has now become um, a, a no-go zone is, is pretty extraordinary given what America said from the outset of uh, Israel's operation in Gaza, which is that it supports Israel. Israel's aims, the war objectives, the return of the hostages, let's not forget, 134 of them, 157 days they have been in Hamas captivity. And, you know, this is a, a female panel, um, so I, I'm sure that the plight, especially of the female hostages, will be f first and, and foremost on people's minds. Um, so it was the return of the hostages, the defeat of Hamas critically, so that they can never present the same threat that they did when they committed those atrocities on the 7th of October. To say now that Israel is prohibited in some way, and some, some of the comments are certainly being interpreted in that way, from going into Rafah um, is a complete 180. It's 
plainly indicative of you know, American polling, the fact that there's an election coming up. But critically, the change in policy, unfortunately, serves to encourage Hamas, as do these very misguided calls for ceasefire. They simply encourage Hamas to continue. They've walked away from the negotiations for our release of hostages before Ramadan, as you've just referenced. And instead of creating a situation in which Hamas are defeated more quickly, in which perhaps they even uh, surrender, in which they immediately release the hostages uh, that are still being uh, kept and tortured by all accounts, uh, instead of that, it encourages them to continue to hold on to those hostages entirely unlawfully uh, and to uh, continue to fire on to Israeli... Do, do you think the British government has changed its position? Because David Cameron's comments have been, I think, gradually over the weeks have become slightly more Israel sceptic? Uh, that's a very diplomatic way to put it. Uh, <laughs> I'm afraid that um, there's been, a again, a real uh, a misguided approach in which Hamas is drawing encouragement uh, from, a, from a position where ultimately it seems that Israel uh, cannot be allowed to defend itself. There's been also, of course, a huge misrepresentation on the humanitarian situation because the level of trucks going through the current crossings, Kerem Shalom, critically, because that is the major crossing for trucks uh, from Israel into the Gaza Strip, but also through the Rafah crossing. Um, the level of trucks uh, that has been passing is very much below the rate at which Israel uh, is currently set up to inspect those vehicles. Uh, and in fact, more trucks could be going in. The reason they're not is because there's a build-up of trucks the other side of the border. This is in Gaza, where there hasn't been the opportunity uh, for aid organisations on the ground to properly distribute. And critically, we've seen video footage with Hamas terrorists on the top of these lorries. They are diverting this aid. There are many reasons that there is a humanitarian crisis in Gaza at the moment, but the, the chief uh, orchestrator of that, of course, is Hamas. By starting this, by hanging on to the hostages, they could end this tomorrow if they were released. Okay. Uh, and by fueling international uh, opprobrium with false messaging from the Gaza Strip, including the casualty figures, which uh, of course, we have to understand, come from the Hamas-controlled Palestinian Ministry of Health. Fine, That's a prescribed but, terrorist organisation. Yeah, no, you're, you're right on that, but those are the only figures we've got to go on. It, it, even if it's, say, 22,000 rather than 30,000, it doesn't... That does not... But a lot of people would say justify the fact that Israel has gone in all guns blazing and whatever they say about targeting Hamas terrorists, clearly they haven't been very good at it, have they? I can't understand why you draw that conclusion. All guns blazing is not the approach that Israel has taken, certainly in well, any previous... Look at the television pictures of all of the ruined buildings. I mean, that, that is not a targeted approach. That is whole communities being razed to the ground. Well, again, this is an impossible conclusion to draw from the photographs that you are seeing that are put out by Hamas media outlets. What we know is that... Is, in is every the BBC previous, a mass... Well, uh, no, but this is, where the pictures are, this is where the pictures are coming from, let's be clear. The fact that the BBC choose to run them and choose to run Hamas Palestinian Ministry of Health figures is a serious problem, which I hope we'll have time to get onto, because that is clearly fueling well, a great deal of the misinformation let, and the skewed hear, public debate. Let's hear from other panellists. Let's go to our next question. It is from Ali in Stratford. Is the Metropolitan police boss right to call out people for filming police officers on duty and posting the footage online. Now the Commissioner Sir Mark Rowley has criticised the army of armchair commentators who are ready to film officers every moment and then post the footage online so people can criticise their actions. There's an interesting point about doctoring video because we, we were talking in the break about the guy that was arrested at the weekend on the, on the Palestine march where he was holding a placard which said Hamas is a terrorist organisation. I think those were the... the, the oh, th this words. is Nayak Gulbani. He's a British-Iranian, uh, um, well, dissident, I suppose, in, in Iranian terms. So he understands what the hate element marches of these um, protests have been about and uh, what an Iranian-backed a terrorist organisation is up to. But he was arrested for dis for holding that poster up and the people, treatment. The people and that were sort of berating him, I gather, well, were more than berating. He stood there, as he often does. He's a, a lone, very brave voice against the terrorist elements of these marches. Standing there with a, a sign that simply, as you just said, you know, Hamas is terrorist, I think were the exact words. Um, and then a reference to the legislation uh, by which they had been fully prescribed in the United Kingdom. And the sign was being torn from his hands and 
reason he was being attacked. He was the one who was in fact assaulted. And it was because of the fact that he had colleagues around him videoing how it is that the crowd treated him and then how subsequently he was uh, dragged away by five police officers. It was very critically only because of that video that the original explanation that was provided by the police uh, that he'd been arrested for his own safety uh, was just shown to be palpably um, well, laughable uh, because he was simply dragged to the ground far away already from from those that had and originally handcuffed. attacked him and handcuffed in a in a in rather a, a lot of force being used i should clarify though i think especially in the context of what's been said the metropolitan police the ordinary officers on the street are being put in an impossible situation and they are facing um circumstances where they aren't able to arrest the real lawbreakers here and they go after the only individual who's won against thousands uh, because it's the uh, the only thing that they're actually able to do they're under resourced they're not being given the proper instructions and the ordinary bobby in the beat has been utterly left down by the police leadership in that respect okay um philip in hull says is there any point in sending someone to prison for a few weeks the justice secretary alex chalk is warning prisons across england and wales could be full by easter the end of this month unless the government passes his proposed new law to stop jailing anyone for less than a year those who commit minor crimes would be given suspended sentences or community service orders instead. Natasha. After a good six years at the criminal bar, um, I'd agree that unfortunately the system is on its knees through chronic underfunding, and we've seen that both in terms of the criminal justice system but also the prisons. But the Sentencing Council guidelines do make it clear that if appropriate, any sentence under two years uh, can, of course, be suspended. And what we've seen latterly... So why do they need this new legislation? Well, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? Um, because there's a question there as to whether or not, you know, the judiciary is actually able uh, to exercise its its uh, judgment independently um, or whether f further tram lines are being instituted. We've seen reports, of course, in The Guardian uh, that uh, there are um, uh, further, uh, perhaps unwritten, um, guidance being given to our members of the judiciary that uh, prisons are full and that they should be taking every opportunity to suspend. Uh, and I think many of my colleagues at the criminal bar would say they've probably seen the impact of that at sentencing hearings for years. This is not a new issue, but certainly because of the underfunding, it's becoming uh, more and more pressing and the guidance is uh, only uh, mounting up. But I'm taking Harriet's point about rehabilitation. You can't rehabilitate someone with a 12-month prison sentence, can you? I mean, what's the point of prison if it's only going to be a 12-month sentence? Well, there are programmes, um, both in prison and also uh, outside, in terms of the probation service, uh, which judges generally consider uh, as part of any sentencing exercise where it's appropriate and they have input from the probation service uh, as to having had an interview and conducted an assessment with the defendant as to what would be appropriate. So all of that is taken into consideration already. And Mark tells us that in Spain, all sentences of two years or less are suspended. <laughs> well, there you go. There's a, there's a thought, isn't it? is LBC.